a game in hell was the result of several collaborations uh, which emerged during the project and it was curated by John and Nicoletta, but it was also a collaboration between GRAD, uh, Krasnogorsk Film and Photo Archives, as well as a partnership with the Maikovsky Museum, who generously loaned us 24 futurist books from their collection. And of course, the idea of this uh, exhibition was linked with the centenary, uh, but it is very important that you understand uh, that in Russia, this war was completely ignored to such an extent that during the uh, school curriculum, only one history lesson in year six uh, was equivalent to 45 minutes, was actually devoted uh, to it. And again, it was put into the context of imperialistic war, and there was no other reference to it at all. And the fact that the first uh, memorial to the Great War, to those who died during the First War, was in Landville 10 years ago in St. Petersburg, and the second one was opened on the 1st of August 2014, uh, speaks vividly for itself. So uh, for a British audience, it is hard to conceptualize the amnesia that surrounds the First World War in Russia. And uh, for the duration of the Communist Party rule, this war, in which at least two million, two million Russians perished, was glossed over and ignored. This was due to the nature of the conflict, which was fought by imperial soldiers on behalf of the Tsar, and the manner in which Russia exited the war in 1918 via the quickly drawn up Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. Although it was not officially a defeat, it was by no means a victory, and the new Bolshevik government was forced to agree to huge reparations and sign over fertile agricultural land for German use. As a result, the so-called Imperial War, which ended for Russia with a brutal peace treaty, was eclipsed by the transformative events of the 1917 revolution. And only recently has Russia's part in the war received the scholarly attention it deserves. In this centenary year, a number of publications and exhibitions have emerged, which are laying the foundations for further research. At GRAD, we hope that a game in hell which explores the visual responses to the war, will add another dimension to this burgeoning area of study. My paper today will look specifically at the photographic albums on loan to the exhibition. Of all the visual media in the exhibition, the photographs are the most revealing, and through them a picture of Russia's social, economic, and political history can be traced. They are the objects that have thus far received the least academic attention, there are only a handful of publications relating to this specific period in the history of Russian photography. Uh, and this is mainly due to the rarity or inaccessibility of such photograph albums. As a result of the momentous changes that Russia underwent at this time, original photographs from the period of 1914-1917 are particularly rare. Emigres had little space for large photographic albums and the nature of life in exile was not conducive to the safekeeping of belongings. Often photographs were damaged, lost or forgotten. In early Soviet Russia, to keep a visual record of the imperialist war was dangerous. Any evidence of involvement in the conflict or knowledge of white army sympathizers had to be hidden or destroyed. As a result, a small number of photographs of the Eastern Front survive in comparison to the hundreds of thousands that were taken by the Allies. In addition to this very, in addition to this very few, in addition to this very few of these collections have been studied, catalogued, or put on display. This absence of documentation reaffirms the importance of the albums in the Shostakov collection on display at Grad. And uh, for me, as one of the organizers of the show. These photographs are the most interesting and important exhibits in, included in the show. They present unheard voices and unseen viewpoints on the First World War. Futurist artists continue to be heard, studied and rightly considered pioneers of their generation. But these photographs, which displayed flashes of brilliance in their ability to compose pictures and capture major events, have been silenced by history. This paper will shed new light on these albums and position them as a rich source worthy of further study. In order to do this, I will look closely at a number of key photographic tropes that recur throughout the collection and explore how they fit into the history of photography in Russia 
and what we can learn from them. Whilst doing this, I will provide an overview of the albums themselves, introducing their compliers and key subjects. And I also hope that this paper will go some way to pay tribute to the numerous forgotten Russian heroes of the First World War. So the exhibition includes collections of photographs from four very different individuals. The largest of these was compiled by Anatoly Martyrov, who was a surveillance pilot and leader of the 7th Air Division. And you can see him on the left alongside Commander-in-Chief uh, Commander of the Field Army, General Silivachev. His photo collection includes a number of images gifted by friends and colleagues, which suggest that Martyrov was well-liked and respected. Uh, his collection can be divided into two distinct volumes. The first is a record of his time at the Sevastopol School of Aviation, where Martyrov trained until 1915. In this photograph, the students of the school are seen with Prince Alexander Mikhailovich, who was considered the founding father of Russian aviation and who uh, raised, raised large sums of money in the name of the building of a Russian Air Force. This volume also includes portraits of fellow students and tutors and numerous photographs of aircraft, many of which are frank depictions of the perils of learning to fly. The second volume is devoted solely to Martyrov's time in the 7th Air Division and as such can be described as a regimental album. The variety of photographic subjects in this collection is staggering. Alongside groups and individual portraits of the regiment at work and leisure can be found starker pictures of the casualties and realities of life on the front line. The value in this album lies in the fact that it is a personal rather than official album and therefore presents military life through a lens that is, in theory at least, more revealing than state-controlled documents. Despite Martyrov's popularity and military achievements, he was awarded all but one orders of St. George. He tragically committed suicide in 1919, leaving a note to his mother, and I quote, Mother, I'm sorry for my actions. I haven't forgotten Christ's commandments, but necessity compels me to live in the manner that he didn't teach. This is very difficult. This is so hard, but there is no other way out. With love, your son, Anatoly. The survival of this album is difficult to explain. Although his name can be found on Red Army officer lists, this is by no means an indication of his loyalty to the new Bolshevik regime. Indeed, from the manner and timing of his death, it is not unreasonable to suggest that Martyrov was disillusioned with the instability and violence of the new Russian. The second album, compiled by Lieutenant Colonel Vyacheslav Tokarevsky, is similarly thorough in its documentation of life on the Eastern Front capturing scenes of battle alongside major events and interesting daily observations. Uh, Tokarevsky provided stri a striking hand-drawn title page for his, uh, inscript for his album uh, with the inscription Memoirs of the Great World War. The rest of the album shows similar flourishes of individuality. Photographs are arranged by date and location, and each double page spread includes a map for reference. In addition to this, every image has a hand-drawn frame and is often accompanied by a caption. Clearly, Tokarevsky took particular pride in the presentation of his collection. Unlike Martyrov's aviation albums, which appear to be assembled from photographs gifted to the owner, this collection presents itself in the form of a photo diary, with images both captured and arranged by Tokarevsky himself. The historian Sergei Volkov, who was one of the contributors to the catalogue, has suggested that the book was carried by the lieutenant throughout the war and regularly updated, although this is difficult to prove. The survival of Tokarevsky's archive can be explained by his loyalty to the Soviets. In 1917, he was drafted into the Red Army as a head of department at all Russian general staff, and he continued to hold official positions for the rest of his life. Although he was apparently allowed to keep his album, he was still required to censor his own images and obliterate undesirables. So how typical are these images, and how do they relate to the history of Russian photography? 
The book Photography in Russia, 1814-1940, edited by David Elliott, has been an invaluable reference point for this paper. But even this authoritative publication <coughs> skips the First World War period and touches only briefly on amateur photographers. According to Elliott, the notion of photography as an art form has existed in Russia almost since its conception. Sometimes referred to as light painting, Photography responded to trends in painting, often mimicking the subject matter and compositional setup. As a result, impressionistic style landscapes and genre studies of Russian peasants and rural communities proved popular with Russian photographers. War and press photography came later as cameras developed new portable formats. The first war photographs were taken in 1815, 50s, most famously by the Englishman Roger Fenton. Heavy equipment and low exposure times limited these early war photographers to post shots or pre or post battle scenes. The development of portable cameras began in the 1870s and by the turn of the 20th century, the technology had been revolutionized, allowing pictures to be taken comparatively quickly, a necessity for the modern press photographer. One of the pioneers of reportage photography was Karl Bula. Along with his sons Victor and Andrei, he established the Bula Photographic Agency in 1910, which sold images to all major press outlets in Russia. This famous image by Bula showing the aftermath of a terrorist attack in St. Petersburg perfectly encompasses the need for press photographers to be ready to respond to unplanned events. We can see similarities between these types of reportage images and some of the photographs in the photo albums in display. Jane Carmichael, in her book First World War Photographers, suggests that M2 cameras often had the age on professional models. Pocket Kodak were far smaller and more easily maneuverable, and in 1916, the Kodak A3 autographic special, made specifically for the M2 market, became the first camera to have a direct link between the lens and the viewfinder to ensure images were in focus. As a result, photos like this showing scenes from the mist of battle could be more easily captured. <coughs> it is not surprising that, that within these albums we can find standout photographs that seem to be of press quality. The following sequence of photographs, which show a visit from Tsar Nicholas II, are taken from Martyrov's regimental album. Unofficial press photographs of the Tsar and military manoeuvres were reportedly forbidden, yet here we have a series of remarkably candid images of the monarch. The fact that these were intended as personal photographs perhaps explains the apparent leniency shown to the photographer on this occasion. Nevertheless, their quality and content would have made suitable press photographs. Uh, of a similar standard is yet another photograph from Martyrov's album, which shows Alexander Kerensky, Minister for War and later Prime Minister of the Russian Provisional Government, addressing troops before battle in summer 1917. The spontaneity and energy of the density of the crowd effectively conveys the excitement and agitation of the troops and the regard in which Kerensky was held at that time. It is in stark contra contrast to the distance and solitude of the Tsar during his inspections. This additional image of the Kerensky, who stands alone and in close proximity to the photographer, further reinforces the aloofness of the Tsar. It is remarkable that one collection of personal photographs could so comprehensively represent the political changes that were undergoing in Russia at that period. And of course, these images alone prove the worth of the collection as a historical source. The most Technical and sophisticated images in the collection are the aerial surveillance photographs. Although the first semi-automatic camera specifically designed for aerial reconnaissance was developed by Russian, Russian military engineer Colonel Pate in 1911, evidence suggests that by 1914 Russia was not prepared for the scale of the surveillance needed during the conflict. As the necessity of aerial photography became apparent, adverts were published in photography magazines appealing for equipment. And one such advert from 1914 reads, the military authority needs lenses suitable for flying machines and balloons. Give you lenses for aerial photography. Professional and amateur photographers do your duty to your motherland. Remember that victory may depend on knowledge gained from the air. Surveillance was the primary task of the Russian Air Force during the war. 
The photographs effectively and clearly communicated the positions of enemy troops, trenches and supplies, information which would subsequently be used in the planning of major offences. This was taken by an assistant who sat behind the pilot and who would lean the semi-automatic aerial camera over the side of the plane and capture multiple images. As a pilot, it is unlikely that Martyr would have taken this picture himself, although he clearly considered them important enough to add to his album. And I would also like to take a moment to appreciate the aesthetic quality of these photographs. The stunning visual documents would have been seen by many avant-garde artists who saw military action during the war, and there is little doubt that their unusual marks and contours and an ended view of the world inspired those artists who searched for a new type of reality. This was already mentioned by John, and Christina Lauder has also written eloquently about how Malevich in particular was inspired by aerial, aerial photography in his development of suprematism. One of the most prevalent image types in these albums are portraits. Individuals were, and as we're very well known, still are captivated by the act of reproducing their own image. From the beginning of the 20th century, personal cameras such as the Kodak Brownie had become cheaper to buy, and the time-consuming development processes had been taken over by the manufacturers themselves. For the first time, society was able to repeatedly explore and record its image. Even if the Romanov princesses succumbed to the allure of the photography and were known to each possess cameras on which they recorded every facet of their daily lives. The aviator portraits in the collection are particularly fascinating in the way they adhere to a familiar international stereotype uh, of how a pilot should look. This portrait of Alexander Rayevsky adheres to the trend, but presents the subject in profile and displays a professional quality that the other images lack. Rayevsky was one of Russia's most skilled pilots and completed a record-breaking number of flights and won numerous accolades. He was also a tutor at the Sevastopol School, where he earned a reputation as a perfection and strict disciplinarian and was hated by his students. Here he met Martyrov, who became a favorite. And their close bond meant that many of the photographs in the first volume of Martyrov's collection were taken by Rayevsky, who was himself a keen photographer. The annotation on the corner of the image, possibly added by Martyrov, translates as from the surface to space. Perhaps the most intriguing subject of all is the way these amateur photographers depict the darkness and catastrophes of war. This page acts as a memorial for the pilot lieutenant Anatoly Shkarin, who tragically met his death on 23rd of March 1917 due to a technical fault in his plane. And it's, it says, I know that it says 23rd of April, but that's a mistake made by Martyrov. Uh, for his heroic deeds during military action, he was posthumously awarded the St. George Cross. Martyrov is not squeamish in placing the wreckage of the crash, and even a photo of his friend's body lying in state next to an earlier portrait of the unfortunate Shkarin. Its frankness is indicative of the matter-of-fact attitude towards death that soldiers adopted during wartime. Official propaganda by its nature spared the public images of Russian deaths, but was graphic in its depiction of enemy casualties, as we can see in this book. World photographers also shied away from the subject. An article from 1915 in Moscow magazine by Melodiev, a representative of the Russian Photographic Society, warned that photographers should not use their cameras, quote, to capture all this horror. This is not our affair, for something that would be a treasure for specialists is not for us, end of quote. Evidently, the soldier and pilot photographs didn't feel the same way. The threat and presence of death was part of the daily existence. I would like to end with this image from the Eastern Front in the Karevsky album. This desolate scene, with its heap of bodies and coal, perfectly encapsulates the tragedy of Russia's millions of forgotten soldiers who died as cannon fodder in Russia's Great War. Its resemblance to Verishagin's apotheosis of war makes the photograph all the more poignant. So what we can learn from these photographs and how do they contribute to our understanding of the visual representation of the First World War? Although photography can be slippery in its representation of the truth and easily manipulated, these albums nevertheless give a valid, multifaceted depiction of the life of a Russian servicemen during the First World War. 
The different styles of photography and the numerous different subjects not only enhance, enhance our understanding of wartime conditions, but also contribute to our understanding of how photography was used and valued at the time. We can confidently assert that these albums are indicative of the popularity and accessibility of photography in the early 20th century. Thank you.